Uh, good morning. Yeah, my name is um, Bill Leister. I've, I've been running the um, the microcap portfolio for uh, since 2008. Uh, the product's been around since 2004, so it's had a pretty long track record. Um, um, so it's, it's been around for, for close on 11 years. I think it was one of the first LICs that listed in uh, in, two, in uh, the early 2000s. And just for those people that don't know, this is just a quick summation of what what microcaps. You know, pretty similar to Sean. It is a good way to diversify your portfolio away from the large caps. It does offer a lot more earnings growth, and hopefully, if we structure the portfolio correctly, uh, you can actually buy stocks that trade at a significant discount to the uh, the PE of both the uh, the small lords and also the uh, the PE of the large caps. Um, so our definition is a is a market cap of around 35 to 350 million uh, market capitalisation. Um, Tracking error is around that sort of five to 12. So it is more risky. So you would expect to get better returns from this space than you would from, uh, from both large caps and, uh, and from the mid cap income as, a, as an example. There's probably 1,600 companies that are within that space. Um, so we've got a dedicated team of 10 people. So you do need a large team of analysts to actually look, look within this space and try and find opportunities. Because there's obviously a lot of companies and you have to, uh, to uh, if you throw out all the exploration type players, all of those mining companies, you know, the investable universe is probably around that sort of five to, to 600 uh, companies. So, you know, there's a lot of ground to cover here. And, um, you know, I think as a, as a group, we've probably, through the reporting period, we've probably seen between six to 700 companies report and also catch up with through trips and companies coming to see us. And I think, you know, one of the benefits of having an LIC listed is the fact that companies do ring us and do come and see us because they do see us as long-term investors within the uh, within uh, within this space, you know we, we've had companies since two, we've held on to these companies since 2004. So, you know if if the story is right, the the, the business model is correct. You know we'll stick with these companies through their uh, through their uh, as as they develop their business model over time. Um, that just on the sell discipline. So as these companies grow, so when, once they move above 350 mil market capitalisation. We'll give, we give ourselves 12 months to exit that story and then look for other microcaps in that space. So that's that's essentially how we lock in profits and then look to uh, to reinvest back into the space. So we can own between 50 to 100. Currently, we've got around 70 stocks in the portfolio, so we're not we're not looking to uh, to see that change uh, too dramatically. And just on that last line, it's just we've got around 300 million in microcaps uh, currently. So we manage money with the LIC, but we also manage money for. Uh, uh, for wholesale investors also, such as the union funds and um, some of the banks. Um, so we can carry cash. So we've actually, back in 2008, we carried close to 50% in cash. Um, so we do make that, you know, as George said, we are a top-down manager, so we will make decisions on how the economic cycle is unfolding. So back in 2008, we were obviously very cautious in regards to what was happening economically. So we built, we built the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the cash up to 50%, and then as we became more confident, Post that 2008, we uh, we look to uh, we look to reinvest the funds, and this is just a snapshot of the performance. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of secs, but the, I mean, I think it's you've got to be patient with the with with these types of names. Obviously, the three months has been a little bit softer, uh, but if you look at it since the seven years and also since inception, we've had some pretty strong outperformance versus the benchmark, uh, which is the All Lords Akeem. So you know, you know, around that 15% per annum is, is not a bad return. You know, sacks up pretty well against uh, against other managers and also against uh, other products out there. Uh, this is our top 20. So on the right um, are really the, the big companies within the small cap space. You know that we just can't own. So things like Blackmores are just far too big for uh, for this fund. We did we did participate in that uh, in what was going on in China. So we actually A2 Milk was one it was in the top 10. Um, but we just felt that that commoditisation was starting to happen as far as infant, infant milk being sold into China. We're starting to see some of those companies such as Danome looking to, to cut prices and that did concern us and we thought it was pertinent to actually uh, lock in profits on A2 Milk. So A2 Milk is not part of this portfolio currently. But most of those ones on the right are just too big for this portfolio. Um, and if you look on the left, you know, we do, you know, we do, we do own resources. I mean, it's in the case of gold, we do think gold is, does hold a place in this portfolio. Uh, we do think it's, you know, if you look at when, you know, economies are weak, when the US dollar is under pressure, you know, gold stocks can actually perform quite well. And Saracen has become the largest stock in our portfolio purely because of its performance. So, I mean, the one thing we like about Saracen, I would say gold is 
probably one of the hardest commodities you can try and pick um, in exactly what it's going to do. But I do think you can find pockets of companies where they, you know, the, cost, the cost structure is correct. They have got very strong organic growth profiles. So something like a Saracen um, is, a, is a gold stock you know, that we would say um, you know, still looks pretty good value. Having said that, it's now trading at $1.25. Um, it's had a pretty good run from 20 odd cents when we first bought it. So you know, we are probably looking to take a little bit of profit out of Saracen and look to reinvest back into uh, to other gold names. So other gold names such as Dacin, and I've got another one which, is, which I'll talk about in a sec, but it's probably a little bit more speculative than, uh, than what Saracen is. Um, so it's quite a diverse portfolio. So Maine Farm is a, ge a generic drug producer. Hub24 is a, uh, essentially a, uh, a fundy. SG Fleet, uh, they do um, uh, novated leasing. Uh, QMS Media, which we think is still a very, very good story. Outdoor media, advertising is probably the strongest growing sector of, the, uh, of media. Free-to-air is that big area where you're basically seeing uh, companies move their advertising dollar spend away from uh, free-to-air and move it back into outdoor. So. It's probably bigger in, I think, New South Wales government, there's some issues in regards uh, to putting these types of uh, billboards on, uh, digital billboards on freeways. I don't think the, uh, some of those uh, local councils are very keen on. But in, in Victoria and Queensland, New Zealand, all, all parts of Asia, QMS have, uh, have, have a number of these billboards and it's proven to be quite, uh, quite lucrative. Uh, Catapult is one of those stories that we, we talked about last time we were, uh, we were doing the rounds. Um, it continues to do well. These guys have a GPS system which essentially measures the, um, uh, essentially measures the, uh, for footballers essentially. So AFL, uh, most of the big rugby AFL players in Australia use this technology and they're essentially trying to take this technology overseas. Uh, stock's done incredibly well. We bought it around 50 odd cents. It's now trading at 280, I think. Um, but it still looks pretty attractive. We do think they've got a technology that will continue to, uh, to dominate that market for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. And similar to Sean, GPT Metro is, is one that's under takeover currently. So that's one that we'll look to, uh, to take out of the portfolio and, uh, and look to reinvest back into, uh, into other stocks. Austal ships we've owned for a while. I'm not sure whether, I mean, these guys have made a lot of money building ships uh, in the US, competing against um, some big, uh, big American companies and in the process of uh, hopefully going to win some, some of these new contracts that the, uh, the federal government is going to put out on uh, some of those ships out of South Australia. You know, so we think Austral Ships is one of those stories that will continue to show pretty strong uh, growth. And that's just a snapshot looking at the, looking at the sectors. So we do think pharma is a, is a pretty exciting space. Uh, some quick stocks to mention. Medical Developments, which is the, the company, anyone that's been on an ambulance, um, it's a, uh, essentially used, it's a uh, pain relief drug. It's a green whistle that I think you might have seen in, uh, on footy players using. Um, it's been highly successful in Australia and also New Zealand. Well-known technology. These guys are going to take it into Europe and the US. So we think something like a med medical developments uh, is a story that we will continue to, uh, to perform quite well. So there's probably a couple of themes. Disruptive type technologies is, is still playing a big part here. So a lot of those IT names uh, we continue to like. Probably one area where we've in we have increased the weight Metals and mining probably six to 12 months ago was, was around that sort of negative six to negative eight percent. Uh, one area we have increased has been lithium, so I'll talk about that in a second in regards to some of, the, some of the thematics that we think are playing out in the longer term and also some stocks that we like within, the, uh, within, this, uh, within this space. But as a, as a portfolio goes, we're still underweight edit, we're still underweight mining. You know, as George said, we don't see China as being, you know, going to show strong growth rates and have massive infrastructure spend. So we are being very, very cautious when we look within the metal space just to make sure we're investing in commodities where we think the supply demand balance uh, is, uh, is, uh, is positive. And in the case of lithium, I think that's one area where I do think you're going to see some strong demand versus some, uh, some supply coming longer term, but I think it's going to take time for this supply to catch up. We have carried more cash. We've, we have been bullish on markets. So futures, for example, we use as a bit of a balancing item. That does look like a big figure, 9%. Uh, but in the last month, we've invested about 5% of that back into, uh, back into the market. So when you look at our cash position, it's sitting around that sort of 25 to 3%, which is, uh, which is more normal. And as Sean showed you and George showed you, I mean, <coughs> this is what we like about, this is what we like about micros. So, Price to earnings ratio, of call it around 12 times versus the, uh, versus the smalls of about 14. Um, reasonable dividend yield for the portfolio, um, but the growth is really what we're trying to focus on here. We obviously will pick up dividend as we go if we can find companies with reasonably strong growth, uh, good strong um, cash generation obviously showing some pretty strong growth in dividends, we'll, uh, 
we'll look at those companies also. But if you look at that 41% versus 11.9, I mean, that's really what micros are all about. You invest at a very early stage, you try and capture it as they're trying to, to, uh, to prove their business model and they can have some pretty strong earnings growth you know, as, they, as they start their, uh, their process. And I just wanted to sort of, this is, lithium to me is one of those areas we, we've been, oh, I've been talking about it for a while, but I do think we're at a stage now where um, post this announcement from Tesla, which came out about a month ago, and I just wanted to show you a quick clip. I mean, the interesting thing with this, I mean, basically, uh, Tesla, Tesla talked about 100, he talked, uh, Elon talked about 185, but it's now up to 500,000 cars. So it, it is a story, I think, that's going to develop over time. I don't think this, you know, it's going to be the, uh, it's going to happen in the next two years. But I do think over the next five to ten years, you're going to see, you know, a level of electrification of the car industry. And I think this is something that, uh, um, I've actually ordered one myself, so uh, we'll see how it goes in two years. But I do think the, um, the, the demand side of the equation looks pretty strong for the next, um, at least the next sort of five to ten years. Um, when you look, at, it is a very small industry, it's only 200,000 tonnes. If you look at versus China, for example, as far as steel production goes, close to a billion tonnes of, uh, of, uh, of steel is consumed in China. So this is versus 200,000 tonnes. So this is a very, very, very small market. Um, it is controlled by a number of players, not so much China, but, but, in, uh, but in South America. So, you know, there are a number of Australian companies from a supply side that are pretty well established here. And if um, I do think it is an area that I think there is an opportunity to make some, uh, some money out over the, next, um, over the next three to five. It's used in a number of areas. Consumer electronics, just reach into your pocket. Obviously, lithium-ion batteries really drive most of the, uh, the technologies in our, in, our, uh, in our phones. But this is obviously a new market. You've also got the energy storage market, which potentially could be an even bigger market, but there's going to be a lot of other batteries that will be competing in that space, such as Redflow, which has that zinc bromide battery. You've also got lead acid batteries that are going to be trying to uh, trying to take part of that market also. So lithium-ion, obviously Tesla is going to build a power wall. They've all, they, they're, they're selling them currently, so you'll be able to put these lithium-ion batteries off the side of your home with a solar battery, uh, with solar, which will essentially uh, produce your own power. So bo both the power wall and also the car industry, I think, is going to be quite an exciting uh, story for the next few years. If I did this presentation probably four months ago, there were probably 10 exploration companies looking for, for lithium. It is a common mineral within Australia, or sorry, within the, uh, within the globe. Uh, Bolivia, I think, is one of the largest, one of the largest resources of lithium, but, but uh, Bolivia is a very difficult place to do business in. But within Australia, we've got 45 exploration companies now looking. So there will be a lot of companies looking for lithium. Um, from our perspective, you know, hopefully we can discern between the, uh, the good stories and the bad stories, which is, and I'll talk about a couple now. Um, the supply side, as I talked about, a lot of it comes out of South America. So companies like SQM, um, FMC, these, these, these are very big companies. They're about between 1% to 2% of their revenues come from lithium. So it's not a huge part of their, uh, their, overall, uh, their overall businesses. But things like Oricobre, which we've had in the portfolio, uh, since 2000 and uh, since 2005, it's taken this. This company's in Argentina, finally producing lithium. So it does take a while for these companies to actually, uh, you know, once they commit to a deposit, to actually build and commission the the, uh, the plant. I mean, Oricobre is still going through the commissioning phase now, so they're probably at about 70% capacity. But I do think, um, you know, that all those three names there, Galaxy and General Mining, are both in Western Australia. So this, these two companies have got a 50-50 JV on the same deposit. So this used to be a, a lithium deposit, a lithium mine, about five six years ago. Um, uh, Galaxy had some issues. They tried to go downstream. So there was a guy called Iggy Tan who basically built a. Um, he tried to uh, produce batteries in China, and unfortunately they had a couple of deaths at the uh, at the plant. So it just didn't unfortunately didn't work. Um, but these companies are now producing again, so they've reopened the mine. Uh, they spent about $15 million on it. Um, it looks pretty exciting. Um, so these are the names that we own within the, within the portfolio. So as far as, the demand, sorry, as far as the demand side grows, I mean, we're expecting market growth of between 10%, which I think is conservative. I think you could, you could really see somewhere between sort of 10 to 20% compound growth rate as far as the, as far as the demand. And it is very hard to find commodities uh, with, that, with, that, with that level of uh, demand growth. So the three that we own are Cobra, General Mining and also Pilbara. Um, and if you look at the charts, you know, it's, it's Tesla made this announcement back, uh, you know, back, in, uh, back in April. You know, it's, and obviously the market viewed this as being a, you know, a step change as far as the, uh, 
the lithium market was concerned. So these stocks have performed quite well, and you know it's not going to be a straight line um, going upwards. But I do think in the case of someone like a General Mining, these guys are in production. Assuming they can hit their commission rates, their uh, their uh, their nameplate capacity, you can see the stock you know over time move up towards that sort of dollar range. In the case of Pilbara, this is the largest deposit of, of known lithium currently. Um, it's reasonable grade. Anything over a percent, you would say, is reasonable grade as far as lithium goes. But the company's in a very strong position here. They've raised a lot of the capital that they need to build a plant. Um, so they're going through the, their feasibility study now. So this one's probably a little bit less riskier than this one, but I do think in both cases there's some pretty strong upside that we'll get over the next, um, over the next 12 to 18 months. And this is really the gigafactory which I've talked about. So you've really got a number of different players. So the Koreans are building, uh, the Taiwanese. Uh, this is an iPhone producer, a, a Taiwanese company that actually produces iPhones. Rumours that Apple's actually trying to do the same thing. So Apple is essentially trying to move into uh, to electric cars. But at this stage, they've made no announcements. It's only rumours. So whether they, you know, whether Apple, I think if Apple gets involved in it, I think it would probably give a, a big tick of credibility also. Uh, Build Your Dreams, which is that Warren Buffett company in China that's been around for many, many years. The company's been building batteries for uh, for the last for electric um, for electric motorcycles for uh, for many years. So, if all these gigafactories, and if you look at someone like uh, Tesla's building a 35 giga gigawatt factory, uh, Build Your Dreams has got capacity to, to for 200 um, that's 200 uh, megawatts. So, so gigawatts. So, if all of those get built. This is a 200,000 tonne market. You're looking at between 100 to 150,000 tonnes of more demand for lithium. So obviously a lot of mining companies are seeing this and a lot of mining companies in Australia are trying to find uh, for more lithium supply. But I do think it looks quite exciting over the next few years. Just a couple of other stories. And I think, well, I guess what we're trying to find is stories. We buy them when they're little. In the case of Clover, this is a little company that um, takes tuna oil, turns it into powder, um, and essentially puts it into uh, to infant uh, formula, uh, which now these days now gets sold into uh, to China, and their brand's New Mega. So they've been doing this for quite a period of time. The, the exciting bit, I guess, the change is they're really moving into a, a diff well, they're hoping to move into a different phase of the technology where they're trying to become more of a uh, pharmaceutical type play. So they're in the they're, they they've finished phase three tests on uh, pre uh, on uh, pre um, uh, prenatal babies essentially. So. What, what they're trying to prove, because in a lot of prenatal babies, essentially they're trying to prove that this uh, omega-3 uh, will have a positive impact on, uh, on lung development. So they're in the process of doing the uh, uh, phase three tests. I've just finished them about a week ago, so we're waiting on those, on those test results. Obviously, Brian McNamee has, has some skin in the game here. So Brian has come across this, uh, has come across the company. He's essentially going to fund all the development, all the, uh, all the distribution as far as this pharmaceutical drug is concerned. So the company, based on where the current share price is, but around that, which is around that, we bought the stock at around that 90 and odd cents um, and some more around sort of 30 odd cents. But you can really justify the share price purely based off this infant formula manufacturing business, which they do now. The real upside is whether they can prove that there is a uh, significant um, improvement as far as uh, the uh, the lung capacity within uh, within uh, within babies. I mean, and that's something we'll know over the next few months. We can't tell you whether it's going to be whether it whether it will work or not, but we do think the opportunity is quite large if uh, if uh, if they can prove that's the case. And just on the, I just thought I'd mention a small goal because I do think this is one of those very small opportunities that um, that we came across a couple of months ago. Um, very, very small market cap. It's around 60 odd million market cap. They've made two discoveries. So they've got about a million ounces. We don't, we don't invest in any resource company purely off the back of expiration. So you can justify the share price, well, you can justify a 40, 40 to 50 cent share price based on the million ounces they've currently got. But the exciting bit is they've just had some recent discoveries of some pretty high grade between 7 to 12 grams a tonne. It's early days, but if they can prove up, because essentially what they will do is they'll blend this high grade material with the low grade they've got now. So we've done a, we've done a very basic study on this thing, looking at a DFS, assuming capex spend of around 70 odd mil. You can get share price valuations of around sort of 40 to 50 cents on the story. So Mark Connolly's on the board here. Mark Connolly's been around for many, many years. He was involved with a gold company called Papillon Resources, which got taken out by B2 Gold. 
the companies in Burkina Faso uh, in Africa, unfortunately, you've, you've got to go where the deposits are. Um, we would prefer this deposit was in Australia, but unfortunately, uh, that's just not the case. So it really gets a tick of approval as far as management goes. It gets a tick of approval because the, uh, the ore body looks pretty exciting from our perspective. Um, and it really just comes down to these guys, you know, continuing to, uh, to explore and find more gold. But pretty small company, but we do think that's got the potential to, uh, to do quite well over the next, uh, over the next few years.